No, because normally what it does, oh, it comes yes, on. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, yeah. good. Thank you. Thank you for helping me with that. So good evening, everyone, uh, our friends, and good evening, Mandy. It's very nice to, to meet you. Uh, actually, on my on my case, it's uh, in my case, it's the first time we talk. Um, so uh, we are very happy to have this chance to share with you. And I would like to uh, move on and introduce you uh, to our um, audience. And uh, Mandy, uh, you are British, right, Mandy? Yes. Yes, yeah. you're British. So Mandy Sangheira, she is uh, British. She is an award-winning uh, philanthropist and a global campaigner. Uh, she is also an international human rights activist, motiva motivational and TEDx speaker from the UK, and uh, has been empowered motivating others. Uh, Mandy has over three decades of experience as an expert in uh, various development uh, fields of, uh, of uh, work. She has been uh, working in driving innovation, building strategic partnerships, promoting advocacy, programming areas of human rights, gender equality, accountability, migration, social justice, justice globally, and many others. So she's a speaker and she is an influencer in all important topics that interests us. Uh, so she also uh, has dealt with owner global basis and tackling unconscious, unconscious biases on tech uh, AI artificial intelligence. So you have been doing actually many things. Uh, recently, you have been promoting uh, young women uh, yeah. in this area of uh, technology and AI. And um, you have been on the go for over 34 years, as I understand, Mandy. Yeah. Yes. So uh, we would like to know about your uh, career, your experience, your life experience, actually. Thank you. And uh, uh, you could concrete with some projects that you've been doing. Also, uh, there are some projects uh, related with uh, women in the uh, current war areas, such as Ukraine. Uh, we would like to hear from, about that as well. So thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we would be uh, very happy if you could just share with us all your wealth of experience. No, thank you very much, Marcia. That was a, a lovely introduction, and um, it's nice to meet all of you, and it's great to see such a mix of people from across um, Europe joining us today. Um, so I'm Andy Sangera, and I'm one of the original founders of the UK Force Marriage Unit, which is now celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. So it feels like such a long time ago, but actually some of the things that are still happening in the community in the name of honour, there are practices of early child force marriage, FGM, breast dying and virginity testing. And more recently this year, I was commissioned by the Home Office to work around raising awareness in the community. And I did work with the Roma community, worked with um, newly arrived communities to talk about cultural practices. And so for me, I started campaigning um, back at the end of 89 and started raising awareness of disability. Now, I don't have a disability myself. I'm a woman with a tremendous amount of privilege and I'm very grateful for the most amazing life and the opportunity that I've been given but I had a friend that had a disability that was ending up being forced into a marriage but at the time then I think people saw it as a good fit they wanted to want to look after her and the woman experiencing horrific abuse and then I kind of realized that at the um, raise awareness how do I address this issue how do I 
lobby and educate my community. So this is how I started. And also growing up in the South Asian community in the UK, I saw many women around me experience domestic violence, but they would never go out and report it because of shame and stigma attached to leaving or they didn't know about the services. There were organisations like South All Black Sisters back then who would support women, but actually the women that would go and access those support services would often be shunned and be named and sort of be sort of saying, oh, look, you know, she's a bad woman. And I've changed a lot in the last three decades where women don't put up with abuse and they will um, leave marital homes and kind of restart on their own. And women are a lot more independent financially now and not dependent. But we also know domestic violence affects one in three women and women will stay. And, and abuse doesn't really discriminate against your race, your ethnicity or your gender. It, you know, anyone could be a victim of abuse and one in seven men will also experience domestic violence. And for me, I've always supported everybody, regardless of their ethnicity, their religion, their culture. And it's been really important for me to be a change agent. And one of the things that I realized very early on is that if I want change, I have to work within the system. I need to be lobbying government and I need to be... Um, sort of working from within the system to make that change. And I think that that is more important than ever as I'm working with young people around the world who want to be change agents now, whether it's climate or um, conflict or whatever it might be that's affecting them today that they want to um, advocate. And I always say to people that, you know, we have to be about the cause and not the applause. That is the secret to success. And it's never been about myself. It's always been about the causes that are important to me, Marcia. So I think for me, as I started campaigning, for me, it was always about paying it forward. As I said, I'm incredibly grateful for the most amazing life and great privilege. So how could I use my voice? So I got involved with all party groups in the UK and in, in Brussels around in Europe, looking at cross party, cross country, approaches to issues, especially around violence against women, gender equality. And I've been very lucky to have spoken in some of the most amazing platforms, the UN, UN Women, the World Health Organization, UNCHR, the European Parliament and everywhere else, and actually um, even the House of Representatives three times in Congress. So I feel very grateful. But for me, it isn't about myself. It is about the messaging. It's about about how do I work with those people around the table? If I have the privilege of being at that table, how do I use that opportunity? As I've gone to the World Economic Forum for years now, is around addressing issues that are important for me. And so like I've talked about Iran, I've talked about Ukraine, and I have been involved with a group of women evacuating 398 Afghans when Kabul fell. And I was involved with evacuating over 100 Ukrainian women who were at risk of sex trafficking. So for me, it is about like working in partnership because I can't do any of this work on my own. And I think it's really important that um, we learn that, you know, we're stronger together. And one of the things that I have learned over the years is sadly, you know, there are organizations and individuals that want to do good work, but sometimes they are too scared to collaborate and partner with somebody else, especially when there's funding and they kind of think, oh, um, you know, I want that funding. But instead of like uniting and putting a bid in together, you'd probably be more successful. So I think that for me, it is really important trying to educate and change mindsets. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that we have seen, like the UK over 10 years ago, the 10th anniversary this year is around Syria and Iraq, Iraq and we've had refugees and we've had the resettlement programme. And I've been involved with supporting the UK government with resettling refugees and making sure that newly arrived women have access to education. They are able to integrate, that they're given opportunities to be getting into employment and also empowering them to know that they're rights, because sometimes what will happen is some of these women will end up staying in abusive relationships. They will stay 
because of the honour and things. So I feel like some of the things that I was tackling growing up in the UK and as a young person, some of those things have started to come as we've welcomed new migrants and new refugees to the UK. It's about educating people. So it's really important to show that actually if our wives are going out to work or they're getting an education, they're able to help contribute to our life in the UK. And it's also about trying to educate them around child force marriage that actually, sadly, we don't have a right to make life changing decisions on behalf of our children. So there's been a lot of work that I've had to do behind the scenes. And one of the things in the last 15, 16 years, I have fell into tech. I mean, honestly, I'm not the person that can sit here and build you things, I can assure you. And I'm the worst on bloody Excel as well. But however, um, I ended up looking at ethics and looking at things when we were building things. And I realized that there wasn't enough women around the table. There was definitely not women that looked like me of color. There was definitely not women with disabilities around the table. So how do we have that representation? So I started campaigning and started to raise awareness. And I ended up speaking at a conference many years ago now, so like 16, 17 years ago, kind of challenging people around the diversity in tech. And people really liked what I was saying. And I was being my whole authentic self. I wasn't pretending to be something I wasn't. I was being the Mandy Sangera that's having a conversation with you. And I mm -hmm. was telling them, look, you know, how do we get in? You know, how do we get involved in this? How do we address these issues? And, you know, fast forward, I've been here and I've done hackathons in over 144 countries and I've spoken at every global tech conference around the world and I've been able to travel around the world three times. So I feel very privileged and grateful for an amazing career. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have a question or anything from me, Marcia. Well, well, I'm actually, I feel I want to listen more from you, but uh, it's okay. We okay. can we can interrupt with some questions. Um, and yeah, please do, please do. Yeah, feel free to everybody because I don't want it just to be about my voice. Please feel free to raise your hand. And if you want clarity, okay. please well, do, because um, I, I want like it to be interactive. To, to ask you actually has to do with the beginnings of your, of your, um, activism uh life activist yeah. right life and uh, so why exactly you felt uh geared to that uh um to dedicate yourself to this type of um, activity uh i would like okay. to understand so I grew up in a South Asian community and I was brought up in a very loving, caring home. I was a woman that I realized that I had a privilege where I was able to speak up, stand up for myself, where a lot of women around me at the time in the 70s and the 80s were not. They were seen but not heard. I think that there's a couple of things there where I was the first child, first grandchild, a bit spoiled. And I think that I gave me a strong sense of self. I belong to a faith called Sikhism and also follow Hinduism. And in that, there is a concept of seva, which is service. And then in, within Sikhism, there is something called standing up for social justice and that equality. And those things were sort of like part of my DNA growing up. So mm -hmm. when I saw my friend being abused, I knew that it was wrong. So I decided to speak out. And I know that people around me, even my own family and stuff were saying, like, we don't speak up, we don't get involved in other people's business, but I knew that it was wrong. So I think that I had an intuition and a moral compass that I knew right from wrong. And I also knew that I had a voice and that I had to be a voice for that person. Mm -hmm. So I ended up supporting a person with a disability. But then I realized that there were other women around me, people within my own family network, relatives and stuff that were experiencing DV, but they wouldn't go out and speak out. And how do you address that? And it was about challenging and it was about trying to break that cycle, trying to empower your aunts and people around you to say, look, you know, this isn't right. This isn't how one should live and you need to be the change. I then went to live away in North America and there was newly arrived communities that were arriving from the globe. South from India, Pakistan and stuff. And I saw that these women 
who were migrants at that time or came on spouse visas were really vulnerable. They wanted to stay, would end up in an abusive relationship. Some would be forced into a marriage. So I realized very early on that there were things that were happening in the name of honor and culture that were wrong. Mm -hmm. And I kind of fell into my kind of life purpose and life service. But, you know, life has not always been kind to me at times. You know, I lost an ovary when I was 21 to cancer and I ended up having horrendous gynecological problems. I ended up having a hysterectomy in my early 30s. But I kind of realized that my life was destined for more. It was a life of service to pay it forward to everybody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though I have gone through my own challenges and things, I kind of always held on to the privilege and being grateful to God for the most amazing life and opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, like I said earlier, for me, it's never been about me. It's always been about the cause. And I've never wanted to occupy the space of survivors and victims. I've always wanted to be the expert in the room to talk about those issues. So when I talked about people with intellectual impairments and disability, I was talking about the capacity, their lack of understanding of what a marriage and a commitment was. I was never going to take the voice for those people. And I've seen many charities come and go in the last three decades, you know, over the last 34 years. And it's always been like using, sadly, survivors and victims to raise their voices. But for me, it's not about that. I've just come back from CSW, the status of women in New York, and you know, did many panels and events. Mm -hmm. But this year I took two people that I mentor and support, Nina, who is a victim and survivor of an early child forced marriage herself, and got her to arrange her own event. So for me, even though I've been given seats at the most powerful offices around the world, whether the UN or the House of Representatives or European Parliament or wherever it may be, I sent the elevator down and brought other people up behind me because for me, that's what motivates me. It's not about the accolades and the awards and all these things, because those things, you know, then don't give you the satisfaction of making a difference to people's lives. And mm -hmm. this year, when I went to the UN, I did an event with some of the Afghans, and there were some people that I got out of the country, but I never even knew them. And it was so emotional because it made me realize that actually my life may have not gone the way that people in my society would want me to do, have 2.4 children, because that card was not dealt to me. I made the most of the ones that were dealt to me. But those children that I have brought out on planes and got them settled in the US or the UK, America, France, Germany, wherever else around the world, that I have been able to do something for them that they will never be able to repay me back. And, you know, that sense of service and that giving to somebody without wanting anything other than just to be a humanitarian is what motivates me and is what drives me. And I think for me, when I met the young people in the UN and they were sitting at the UN decision-making table alongside me, I think for them, it wasn't just about that, but for them, they were so overwhelmed and emotional because they know that if they had been left behind, they would not have been allowed to finish their education. They would not have been allowed to work. We know that the Taliban has taken Afghanistan back to the Stone Ages. I mean, it's gone back that girls cannot go to school anymore. Yeah. So again, you know, for me, it is about using my privilege and really making sure that victim survivors and young people have that opportunity to speak at those most important tables. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. It's really indeed, it's so important to grow uh, being uh, grateful for what we have and for our lives so that later on we can actually uh, give to others what we have received in a way. It's, uh, it's really um, yeah. very, very important, that experience for us. And um, I actually would like to ask you, one question that is coming, just one second, uh, from one of our listeners. And uh, uh, the question is the following, what are the key warning signs or indicators of forced marriage that individuals should be aware of? Something very practical related to what um, you've been doing. Okay, so but we would so sadly 
you know, children are being forced into marriages by people that are known to them. Often their families are the perpetrators in this. And sometimes it's not even about dragging the child and taking them out of the country. Sometimes what they'll do is put the child under so much pressure and duress. Sometimes a child might be dating somebody from a different religion or a caste. They may be that they seem to be too westernized or their sexuality, we're trying to control it. Or somebody with a disability, we want a carer for them. So there's different motivating factors. And sometimes a child could be pulled out of school. If you're in there, sometimes a child seems very withdrawn and seems under a lot of stress and is kind of was a really A star student. And all of a sudden, their behavior, their attendance has really changed. There's unexplained markings on the child because they've been put under physical assault. We don't know. But, you know, it's a criminal offense now in the UK. It carries a seven year prison sentence if you force your child into a forced marriage. And just as FGM will happen over the summer holidays, children are taken out of the country or sometimes they even happen in the UK. We have seen children's mothers actually burn their daughter's breast in the UK because they don't want them to. So what I would say to you, it is about kind of listening to your intuition. If somebody discloses something to you that you know to report it, I mean, it is really, really difficult because a lot of victims don't, they want the abuse to stop, but they don't want to report their parents. They don't know where to go for help. And it's really important because the forced marriage unit is there to help you. It's there to advise professionals. It's there to support young people. And, you know, over the last 20 years, you know, people have been rescued from the global south, from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and other countries. And as newly arrived communities are coming here, sometimes we'll try to do a nikar, which is a, a Muslim wedding, or they'll try to do a, a religious ceremony and not carry out a, um, a UK civil marriage. So we have to say to them, look, the rigid religious marriages will also be recognised because we recognise that you recognise it as a marriage and so do we in the UK. But it is a lot of work to be done around this. And if you are at risk, and I know that we've said to people, if you've been taken out of the country, stick some metal or something in your spoon, like a, anything that you can take off that would set off on an alarm. So you would be pulled over by the airport security. You know, all we can do is give people practical advice. If you know that you're going to be taken out of the country, try to tell somebody that you trust where you're going, the village, the area. So actually that time is off the essence because you're fighting to try and bring somebody back or trying to stop somebody from suffering horrific abuse. I mean, I was in the States now when California is looking at ending child marriage there. And people are like, what? why is that happening in America? Does this really happen? And sadly, children are being forced to marry their rapist so he doesn't have to go to prison. So, you know, it's not just a problem for the minorities. This can happen to anybody. We've seen Caucasian victims, we've seen Asian and black and any, you know, every color in between. So I just wanted to say that as well. Yes, yeah, definitely. It's not something I'm here in Spain and it's not something that we see very often here, but still it happens to other uh, nationalities who are living here. Doors. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes, uh, I have. And I think for me, like, it is yes. really important. Go on. No, no, no. Uh, you can. But I think if, if people are here, the professional, sorry, all I was going to say to you, because if somebody does come to you and discloses a harmful cultural practice to you, or they feel that they may be at risk, we have a duty to report that to the police or to social services or to some sort of frontline protection services in your own country, because it really is important. And so... You know, the UK is the first country around the world to set up such a unit. And I know that we've tried to work with other countries to set such practices up. And all I would say to you, you need to be very clear about protection and not political correctness. You have a duty to safeguard young people before mm. anything else, because there is nothing honourable about abuse. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's important to know all that there is there, all the rights we have. Um I would like to um, raise another question. Yeah. What support and resources are available for individuals who are at risk or have experienced forced marriage? Okay, I mean, the, so this is a really tricky one, but it's a really good question. So thank you for asking. Uh -huh. um, the problem we have in the UK is that a lot of spouses that come over from the from other countries are 
um, on spouse visas and sometimes don't have recourse to public funds sometimes and they are dependent on the spouse and sometimes women don't know their rights but the UK does have a, dis a, dis a DV discrepancy that they could help you to get indefinite leave to remain. Refugees, refugees, sorry, have places sometimes, but they are very far and in between. But one of the things that I will say to you that I have seen be a real issue is that sometimes if people don't have no recourse to public funds or they don't have money, they don't always take them. But mm. it, the forced marriage unit is there. Your first point, they would support you, try to guide you. They could bring you back to the UK and get you back into the British Embassy to, to move you out of mm -hmm. your home. The police are there to also support young people. The local authority has a duty of care and a safeguarding to also protect the child in need as well. So there are lots of different processes. It depends on your age. It also depends on your status. It depends on the kind of, you know, the, the, the nuances there. So there's not one case that fits all. But, you know, the, the, there is support there if you need it. There's many organisations that support people. There's a whole list on the website for the forced marriage unit that you could go to for advice as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. thank you. Okay, we have a very nice group of people here, Mandy our friends and i'm sure they would love to to address you and to uh, interact with you a little bit so this is the moment for you to to talk directly to mandy and uh, raise any possible questions you may have we have here um Anne schaffner thank you Hello, Mandy. My name is Anne Schaffner. I live in Hi, nice Germany. To nice to meet you, too. Um, since That's 1912, nice I've taken care of refugees, specifically since 14, um, November mm -hmm. of 14. Yeah, I'll put them to the screen if you can see. Um, and yeah. uh, I've worked with uh, basically Afghanis. Since uh, 1916, we have, my husband and I, my husband died in December, but we rent uh, two apartments to Afghanis, and my my I've worked a lot with refugees, children, and young adults, and uh, yeah, different in different phases of refugees' life. But I know from working with young adults, the most important thing is to have a personal contact. There must be somebody there to give this personal contact, unless it's not just an organization or a family. It could be a family, but basically one per, it has to be a one-on-one -on -one situation. And I know that this doesn't only exist here in Germany, I'm sure in the UK where you are, or in France or in Spain or anywhere. This is where it comes down to if the person is integrated or not. Do you have any comments to what I've just said? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, look, I mean, I evacuated... Um, over 400 refugees now. Um, and one of the things that I will tell you, it hasn't been an easy journey. It's been quite difficult to integrate with them, sometimes into society. It's about managing unrealistic expectations. But there is also a tribal thing where people want to live together. They want to be a part of a community. And it's also about trying to educate them about this is what Germany can offer you. This is about what... Um, Sorry, it's got to keep there's a bit of an echo, sorry. Um, it's about trying to educate people and around doing that. And it is really, really difficult because I know myself, I'm having problems with some of the Afghans that I have um evacuated into the States, into Canada. They were given funding for about three, four months, and then they weren't, and then they were kind of left on their own. And they were then saying to me, Well, who's gonna pay your rent? And I said, Look, you're gonna to have to take a job. And I'll give you a good example, because some of the women that I took out, they were human rights activists and campaigners. Yes. And I was saying to them, yeah. look, you may need to go and work in the National Health Service or you need to go and work somewhere else. And they were saying, we want to be a campaigner. We want to be like you. And I said, look, as much as I would want you to be like me, you need to be in your own lane. But I need to be very realistic with you. Now, advocacy doesn't pay a lot of money. 
But however, I have different multiple streams of income. So I have real estate, I do consultancy, I work on projects, I do lots of things. So for me, this is why I'm able to do this advocacy and I'm able to do this work. So it's about managing their unrealistic expectations because actually they were kind of saying to me, well, I don't want to live here. I need to live here. And I said, look, you know what? You can't afford to live there. So you need to be doing that. And it is about being very honest and straight with people about our limitations, about what we can do. I don't believe in making false promises and saying things that I can't deliver on with people. And I believe that, um, you know, it's not been easy because I've got still about 70, 80 of them kind of saying to me, well, I don't want to live here anymore. I mean, I moved people to Spain. They didn't like it. And against my advice, they ended up traveling to Germany and ended up in a refugee camp. And I said, look, my job was to get you out of Afghanistan and save your life. I got you a beautiful accommodation, but because you didn't have any Afghans near you, you've given up a beautiful home and a job to be near people. But now you've ended up in another refugee system. And, you know, there's, there's no guarantee of that. So I think, you know, there is consequences to our actions. If I make bad choices, then I have to live by those consequences as well. We've had the advantage, Mandy, that we have had young men, basically young men, who are willing to work, who came here. One young man worked at McDonald's at, till four o'clock in the morning, took the train home into the Black Forest and came back the next morning to continue working. I mean, these are like ex exemplary people. They now have uh, jobs and and work and um, so, um, anyway, it's a long story, but they don't have German citizenship because- well, No, I think you don't know, but I think you've done a bit, you've think, done some good work there, but yeah, you, and I think as a mentor, you've done yeah, a good as job. As a mentor there. and also my husband, one thing that's important, my husband didn't really want to work with the, he said, I can't work with them, but he is a trained banker and he did the bureaucracy. He read all these complicated letters and did everything and really helped them pick up the phone and call. And this is also a person that, that we, one time we, Nachib and I went to the, um, to the foreign office or the, to for the passes and the visas. And um, a man walked in with, I think they were Nigerian man and wife and small baby or small child. And he had a file this big. And it was everything that he had mm -hmm. accumulated from this family. And this is important to do this kind of bureaucratical work. And it, it seems kind of dry, but it's very important. No, it is. And I think, look, I mean, to, hats off to you for doing the amazing work, because you know what, as we saw Ukraine crisis and we saw people open up their homes to take refugees, I think ordinary British and Europeans have opened their homes and allowed people to become a part of their families, their extended family members. And I think, you know, well done to you for doing that. But I think it's really important that we are here trying to look at empowering people not disempowering them and I think yes, you know yes. well done to you for doing that but I'm also saying to you but you know it's also about being honest with people about yes. what you can yes. deliver because yes. I can't give yes. you something I don't have and I yes. believe in being upfront and honest with people and especially when people are vulnerable and desperate and they want a new life and you know we need to be supporting and educating and empowering people. And we need to help people to transfer their qualifications. So for Ukrainians, sadly, you know, when you leave Afghanistan, Ukraine or whatever, where there's over 20 plus wars around the world, over 100 conflicts, the last thing on your mind is your qualifications or bringing out your university degrees with you. You literally walk out with the clothes on your back. So, you know, you don't always have your qualifications transferred over. You don't end up in the job that you were doing. So it is about survival to try to make ends meet there as well. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very you. much, Mandy. Thank you, Mandy, for that question. Um, um, we have uh, now the mic open for anyone who would like to address Mandy directly. There's Jenny, Jenny Lampert. Jenny? Hi, Jenny. Okay. Yeah, may I say something? Thank you, Mandy. Uh, I mean, this is not um, an area that I'm particularly involved in, but of course, you know, we're all aware of the terrible situation of so many people all over the world. I mean, we just cannot help but be touched by that. And um, just one thing that um, 
that struck me as you were talking was these unrealistic expectations of people when they do come over. This is obviously something um, which um, is almost inevitable, I suppose, unless they have, um, you know, family members who are already integrated into communities in the countries where they've chosen to go. So I wanted to ask you, um, do you have working together with you um, immigrant people who have gone through the process of integration? Through lived experience. Yes, yes, a lived experience yeah. and who can share it because obviously this would encourage people, give them confidence, you know, to continue maybe through a, a difficult period um, and know that it is possible uh, to come through. Yeah, and I think that that's the thing, like I was saying earlier, for me, this is not about me. This is about the lived experience, whether they're people are victims or whether they're refugees or people with disabilities. I'm here to be a voice for the voiceless by helping them. I'm not here to take their space or speak for them. I don't need to do that. And when I meet refugees, and I think people don't recognize this, but actually their education is really effective, but they have the drive. They want the, they want to better their lives. You know, I mean, we're very lucky where we're born on the postcode lottery, but some people are not so lucky. And people are displaced from lots of, not just for war, but for climate and lots of other things, religious persecutions, and people have a right. And I think that we have seen in the UK, over recent years before Brexit, the, the, the media putting out awful messages and we're seeing people coming over and people have a right. And I'm not saying that everyone is perfect because we have good and bad in our own societies, in our own communities. You know, we have criminals born and raised in the UK. It's not just we're saying foreign nationals are coming in and committing crime. So I think that there has got to be the governments have got to change rhetoric. They've got to change the way that they have started to look at this. And if we were to look at the UK and look at some of the people that are arriving as refugees and migrants, they're coming from places like Afghanistan, Iraq and Syria. And at some point we've had a hand in some of the conflicts and settling that part of the world. And we need to acknowledge that and own that. I mean, Ukraine is a very difficult situation and, you know, a sovereign country was, you know, taken over and people have been displaced and people are there. I just think it's really honest that we are trying to do this. And what I will say to you is all we can do is be a voice and try to help people. And if we see wrongdoings, that we stand up and not be scared to call out bad practice, that we're not scared to challenge people because we have to be the change that we want to see. And for me, I'm not here to be liked. And I think, you know, when you get to my age and you've been campaigning for as long as I have, trust me, you can count your friends on one hand, I can assure you. And again, you know, there's like the current conflict and, you know, has really divided the world recently. And it's been very sad to see. But for me, I've always been in my lane for violence against women. And I was one of the very few feminists that spoke out on October the 7th. And people were saying to me, why are you doing that? You know, and I said, this is a terrorist attack. These women have experienced sexual violence. For me, like I said earlier, I don't care what your religion, your culture, your gender is. I will stand up for you if you're a victim of abuse. And I'm not saying what is happening now with the, you know, the reprisals and the, all of that is right, because that is wrong as well, because nobody should have to die. But I think for me, it's really important that I stay in my lane, that I stand up for what I believe in, and that if I stand up for all women, because one of the things that really saddened me was there's a lot of keyboard warriors that all sit here behind a keyboard and they always want to do things. I can count the feminists on my hands that roll up their sleeves and really would be there. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Um, we are open for more questions or comments. If anyone would like. Don't worry, we can call it earlier, so it doesn't matter, because I don't feel like you have to go right to the wire, have... so don't feel bad. And yes. Hi, Britta. Okay. All right. I do. Oh, yes. Here we have Britta. She would have. She would yes. Have a question. Hi, Mandy. Uh, thank Hi, you so Britta. much. Uh, it's very encouraging to listen to you. But I'm also so amazed how you get into areas and fields that are like, how can you say new because you were talking about this thing about technologies you have noticed that there were not enough women's voices there 
and the yeah. IT field, and you said that you were not at all an expert in those things. No, and I wasn't. Also, I wasn't. And yeah, so I'm also curious about this because th this is really a field where I think women, especially in my generation, but even younger generation, feel uh, kind of very limited. And and, and how did you yeah. do that? How did you? Okay. Were, how, I mean, how when you I went to school. Yeah. Sorry. I can yeah. Tell you Sorry, so all I was going to say to you, I, when I went to school, there was a QWERTY keyboard, so I'm telling you my age, and they did not have computers when I went to school. There was not technology the way that it is today when I was growing up. So for me, I kind of um, ended up looking at technology and I ended up on a phone that looked like a brick. And But I was really fascinated by how I was able to just ring people around the world by this mobile phone. Because when I grew up, I mean, I was lucky that we had a phone in our house, but I remember when I was very little, my mum used to go to a phone box up the road to make a call or wait for a call for someone to take a call and all those things. So for me, I've seen things in real time change. And so for me, I got involved in the unconscious biases that were happening in technology. And I ended up, going to an all party and, and then a, a conference and I was sitting in the audience and I started asking questions. I'm quite a curious soul. I can't help myself. I, you know, not here to be liked. I ruffle feathers sometimes, but I am what I am. And I kind of, there was a guy from a big tech company and I started saying, well, why are you not doing this? And why are you not doing that? And he was so fascinated by the way that I had challenged him. And he said, take my card. I'd really want to meet you. And how long are you in town for? I said, I'm here for like a day. And I met with him and he said, look, do you know what? He says, I have hundreds of people that can build me anything, but nobody has the vision or the goals and the ideas that you do. And I'm going to do this hack. Can you come along with me? I was thinking, what the bloody hell's a hackathon? And, and I tell you what, I was so impressed with all the people that were there trying to build all these things and coming up with ideas. And I think for me, I was just like, wow, okay, this is really good. But I've always been very honest about where I fit in the tech industry around the ethics and I sit with who I am as a person because I'm not going to sit here and say I've built this because I haven't I've been a part of something that has been built and I've been built with the, the, the um the ethics or I've been involved in the Pope tripe of the document or something that's been created and you know for me by paying it forward to young people in over 144 countries young girls have built um technology like that can help them from being victims of assaults we've created technology for young people who may have health conditions we've done technology with nasa and things which i'm just beyond grateful for and i've just you know have been able to, to sort of use tech for good to look at issues that were important to me for refugees for trafficking or for violence against women and how can i use technology to help me and that's how I fell into it. But it, and it's just one of those things that I was at the right place at the right time. And I've always been willing to learn and try new things, I guess. But I, I, I love this kind of practical approach you have to the problems because, um, I mean, I think that's what that tech guy he found with you that you have this vision to find a solution on something. And then you're so practical to get to it. I, I really admire that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Brita. Uh, I do have uh, another question uh, for you. OK. Um, yes. How can we overcome societal and cultural obstacles that hinder women's meaningful involvement in peace negotiations and policy decisions. How can we So overcome? there's a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So by, first of all, by having women in leadership positions, mm -hmm. by having women at the decision-making table, smashing the shame and stigma around like rape in conflicts. And it's because actually, Actually, women are the ones paying the price. There's nothing honorable about abuse. And we need to smash that shame and really call it out for what it is. I think that one of the other things is it's about 
mentoring and paying it forward. Mm -hmm. Because to me, I'm so blessed and so grateful that my cup is so overflowing that I have to tip it forward for new things to come into my life. The problem that people have is that they have one contact or they have something they never want to share. They hold on to whatever they have and they have such a mindset of never being open to change or be willing to try something. And I think also for me, I work for the cause and I'm not here to be light. I'm not willing to kind of compromise my moral compass. I was somebody that saw somebody abuse children in the United Nations. It took me four years to take out a pedophile ring in the UN. And people were saying to me, it's going to ruin your character. It's going to ruin your reputation. You won't get the contracts. I said, you know what? Once you see something and you know it's wrong, you can't unsee it. And if I turn a blind eye to this, then I'm just as complicit. So for me, it's always been about the moral compass to do the right thing. And even if I'm standing on my own, and I think that, you know, that is what probably makes me somewhat different to most people. I don't just conform to fit in. I'm not going to lose sleep over what somebody thinks about me because their opinion is that their opinion. It doesn't matter to me. And I think that it comes back to me from that sense of self growing up in a South Asian home as a young Asian woman with very green eyes and very different color, looked different from everybody else. I was left handed. I had ginger hair, green eyes. So, you know, I never fitted into the mold. And I've always been outside the bell curve. And I'm happy being outside there because being the same as everybody else is rather boring. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I would like to um, to uh, refer to this event that's going to take place in Italy, which is called We mm. Make Future, Met Mythic yes. Bahrain. And I, you are going to yes, talk so I, there, right? What are you going to share there? Exactly. Okay, so I spoke at all of that. So I did all those last year, but I'm going to Dubai next month to speak at a tech conference again. So yeah. when I was at those places, these technology conferences, like in Bahrain, in Dubai, or in Saudi, wherever it is, I'm talking about how do I use technology for good? Mm -hmm. And again, by bringing young people up, by bringing young people into robotics and doing AI, or tackling biases and doing the ethics in AI, I have been become a global voice on my own almost and become an expert in these areas and you become the most sought after activist and campaigner. And one of the other things that people are not aware of me though, actually I've always used social media to have conversations. Like I have a Twitter chat, which was called Empowerment Tower. I regularly have like conversations on Instagram. I've always used LinkedIn and things like that. And I think people are fascinated because if we look at some of our campaigners, not many people have been able to be as sustainable as long as I have. And there's a couple of things to that success, I would say, is that I'm authentic. I don't pretend to be something I'm not. And the other thing is, I work for the cause and not the applause. I'm not scared to call out harmful cultural practices. And I'm also big and ugly enough to put my hands up and say, I don't know that. And I'm not pretending to be something I'm not. So when it comes to like the tech and events and stuff. I'm sitting around people that are so talented and so clever at building, but I can hold my own because I know where I fit into that puzzle, if that makes sense. I'm yeah. not competing with anybody else because yeah. like I said earlier, we're stronger together. And I think that people respect you because I was involved with the Abraham Accords, getting involved with the Middle East to bring peace together. Like in Abu Dhabi, in the UAE, they have, a place which is the Abrahamic house, which is looking at the three Abrahamic religions. I don't belong to those religions, but again, it's about how do we bring people together? How do we unite? Because we belong to one race, which is called human. There's harmful cultural practices that are happening in all religions and all cultures and communities. And we have to be brave enough to call it out for what it is, because it's not religious, it's cultural, it's abuse where children are being branded witches and people are being abused in the name of religion and culture. We need to call it out because we cannot be complicit because then you're just as guilty. Yes, that question is a very important. How do we not, how do we unite? How do we work together? How do we bring peace among all religions? Yes. Um, I, I know so you have been, been yeah, I know you have been empowering the next generation. 
the next generation that is working is involved with the AI, artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, could you give one or two hints about what you've been doing with this next generation? Yeah. So like for me, it's really important that that you're not just a mentor, but actually you're a responsor, that you're creating real opportunities. So when I do hackathons with young people and they come up with ideas, I connect them to the money to make, make sure that their product is actually gone to market, or I connect them to the companies that can help them to achieve those things. It's really important that I am not just doing hackathons for the sake of it. For me, it is about like supporting young people to be given work experience that is paid in the tech industry, that women are being given those seats in those tables. So just like myself, um, come along and learn about machines, look at learning about AI, because it's a part of life. If we look at how AI helps us in medicine right now, it can do surgeries and things that you and I would not be able to do. If you have care needs, you need technology, it gives you an alarm at home, it can do anything. It can play your favorite music, if that's all you want to do so it's involved in real time and if you don't move with the times you're going to be left behind and that's what's happened with some campaigners and activists who joined me 30 40 years ago have nowhere be to be seen 20 years ago 10 years ago because they weren't willing to change they were not willing to think outside the box they were being very complacent or comfortable in the space that they occupied and they have not been able to do that or they've gone out of business. And that is what I would say to you. And I think for me, I could set up a charity. I know some of the most richest people on the planet, but then why would I be competing with everybody else? Because I realized that actually I'm a stronger voice on my own. I'm a big enough brand on my own to be able to make the difference than be fighting and trying to fundraise all the time. I'd rather fundraise and pay for things for organizations and individuals and have a life of impact and legacy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, Mandy, uh, we are coming to the end of our program uh, today. Awesome. I know there are some people who would like to greet you, and I would allow that person to greet you very briefly. Awesome. <laughs> there is uh, two hand, two persons. Mm -hmm. hand, uh, okay. Stella Aris and, uh, uh, and I yes, do need to I get off at see. 7 o'clock, though. Sorry, yes. guys. Yeah, I just so, have one, um, Marcia and uh, yeah. Andy, I just have one comment. <laughs> I think it's also important, I feel very, very strongly, to empower young women to be politically active, to take positions yeah, in the society yeah. on like council yeah. members or to be yeah. uh, mayors of small cities or these yeah. kind of things yeah. you can start out. I believe I'm very, very yeah. uh, much for young people to become motivated yeah. to do political um, work just, in this way. This is just my comment. No, thank you for that. No, no, thank you for that. All I'm going to say is if people want to connect, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn on Mandy Sangera, and I will answer any questions that you haven't okay. felt comfortable enough to ask or answer. Okay. And I'd be happy to take that. So if you find me yes. by my name of Mandy Sangera on yeah, LinkedIn, I, can... I will answer that. I saw Stella has had a hand up. Stella's had a hand up for ages, and I just feel a bit rude that she's been waiting patiently sorry Stella oh, sorry I didn't see it so Stella if you would like to say a few yeah. words to Mandy um thank you very much um for the time to speak um just very quickly so my background is data and technology governance and um one of the things I'm interested in right now is AI what I want to put forward is to your point what we need to do is to make sure that women are at the forefront of ai governance we are still in the very early stages of this revolution and already we are seeing bias in the way the code produces results so we need to ensure that the the coding itself is free from gender bias and that ai is used to dismantle and not embed bias so we need to look at it from a gendered lens the second no, thing i, I wanted to just I'm... highlight is and um, the second thing I just okay. wanted to highlight Sorry, is... Was... Um... <laughs> Go ahead, Stella. 
Finish. The second thing I just want to highlight very quickly is, so um, I come from a third world country in Zimbabwe. One of my key passions is ensuring that technology is used for good, like you said, um, that technology is used as an educational tool because when you educate women, the world changes. When you educate women, they make decisions about their health. They make decisions about their children. So I'm quite keen on making sure that technology is used to empower women in third world countries. Please. Lastly, thank you very much for all the work you do. And thank you, President Mititoma, for inviting me. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. No. No, thank you for that, Stella. So one of the things is that we have used virtual classrooms where we've been able to take things into places like Africa. And the event that I did at CSW, we created a raspberry where we could actually remotely take um, learning into places like Uganda as well. So for me, it really is about investing and putting into technology for girls' education. It's something that I'm very passionate about. So if you want to feel free, I can connect you to the to the organization that has created that technology as well. But one of the things that just before we go, sorry, I just wanted to say that, um, sorry, it's just that, you know, like there's a lot of things that people kind of get you know, want to reach out and probably ask certain questions. And I'm sorry, but like sometimes people don't like what I say. And but, you know, I'm not going to apologize for like standing up for what I believe to be right as well, because I think that, you know, if we're all authentic and we're being ourselves and then, you know, the world's going to be a better place. It's really important that we are our whole authentic self. And if anyone wants to take that away, that would be my call for everybody. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this Her Story today. Uh, it was a wonderful session, listening to Mandy's story and learning from her uh, activities uh, all throughout her life. Uh, we are very grateful for this opportunity. We keep uh, contact with you. And uh, uh, if uh, ever we can do something together in the future, I'm sure we'll be able to, to call you and, to, yeah. and uh, contact with you. So thank you again. And uh, I wish yeah. all of you a very wonderful yeah. evening and, uh, and see you next time. See you next time. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Good night. Thank you, Marcia. Thank yeah. you, Sandy. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mandy.